Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremy, founder of QuickMail.io. And this is Jack from Emails That Sell. Episode 27. Today, we're going to do a rapid fire. What is it, uh, Jack? We're going to run through 10 cold email questions. Jeremy and I are going to weigh on each one and move on quickly. So we get to cover a lot of ground here. All right. Do you want to, uh, to go and say the first question? What is the best call to action in cold email? I think the best one is the one that starts a conversation. And that may actually be different depending on your audience. And you could use the call to action to do a lot of things. So you may also not want the call to action to get you a lot of replies. You may actually want it as a filter because you can't do it while you're prospecting or while you're building your list. What about you, Jack? What do you have? The best call to action in my book is an easy call to action, assuming that you would actually like to start conversations with the people that you've contacted. So I'm ignoring the filtering aspect of your answer uh, just because it is helpful, but for the sake of the rapid fire, this is uh, <laughs> going to get you more replies. So more replies are usually good. So a couple that I like, just really short, low commitment kind of questions like any interest or just reply yes if you'd like me to send over a few more details. Yeah, and if you want more information about call to action, check out our episode 18. Okay, number two, what's the best cold email you've received? The best cold email that I've ever received was in my inbox probably two months ago. It started off complimenting the podcast. They've mentioned that they took away a lot of value from it. And then the sort of ask was pretty easy to fulfill. It was a specific question about list building that this listener wanted me to weigh in on. And it was easy to just reply with one or two sentence uh, response, answer to that question. And that actually led to a phone call and we ended up doing a project together. So I think it was a big success for both of us. Very cool. Question three, cold email are not working for my B2B SaaS startup. What am I doing wrong? Question mark. If you went to the cold email doctor and they were to diagnose your problem, they'd first want to look at your open rate. If you have lower than 20% opens per email, then you have a deliverability problem. Focus on that. If you have greater than 20% opens per email, then it's likely your list or your offer or your call to action uh, that's causing the lack of replies. Yeah, I'll go with, we need to define what not working is. Is that, you know, my emails are not getting opened? Is that I'm not getting any response or anything like that? If this is a delivery problem or, you know, you're being, you're being blacklisted or anything like that, you can check out episode 12, 13, and 16 with uh, Tim Jenkins from Sangri to, to get more information as to how to get your email delivered. And what if deliverability is not a problem? What would you recommend? I will look at the audience, first of all, to figure out, like, am I actually reaching out to people that are of interest or that could be interested by my value proposition? Is my email resonating with the recipient? And is my call to action something that is inspiring people to reply somehow? And a good way to check if your email content is resonating with your audience is just to ask yourself if you've sold or intrigued somebody over the phone or in person about this similar content before. Like, it, you know, if you've gone to a networking event and was speaking with someone on your list, could you get them excited about it? And if yes, then, you know, you can tweak your message so it's more exciting. But if you can't get someone interested in on the phone or in person, you're probably not going to have much luck with email. Spot on. All right. So five, what is the best way to send cold emails without your company's domain marked as spam? Well, the first thing I'll do is I actually check out um, the quick mail checklist. Uh, we got one at uh, HTTPS uh, colon slash slash quick mail or tio slash checklist. I think you got like 17 items that you can just go through. Otherwise, just um, check out the episode again, 12, 13, and 16, uh, specifically about deliverability. Yeah, and, and the short list there is, A, don't send from your company domain, use an alias, and limit the links you include in your emails back to your original domain. Next one, uh, what's the best platform to send cold email from? I'll let you answer this one actually, uh, Jack, because I'm too biased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, you're very biased, but I am a quick mail fan. If you're looking for 
a platform to send cold email. So there's a couple of features that I would definitely make sure I have, uh, and that's reply detection. So people automatically stop getting follow-ups. That's being able to include a follow-up message in an email that's being sent. There's the analytic side to it. So you know your open rate and deliverability. There's blacklists that you want to be able to control so certain people won't get your emails. And a plus, I like how I can set up some triggers in quick mail, but of course I'm biased, but those are a few things that I must have when I'm looking at cold email software. Jeremy, do you, do you have any opinion on cold email software? It really depends on your situation. I mean, you could get quick mail, but uh, we don't serve big companies. So if you're one of the Fortune 100, you know, don't even bother contacting us because we really don't care about serving big companies. We're really there to help smaller uh, companies and in startup entrepreneurs and things like that. So if you want like, bigger enterprise thing. I think there is Outreach.io that you could check out. And another competitor we have as well is uh, Reply.io. You should also check them out and then see see which one actually is serving your business best. And if you want more information about that, I think check out episode nine where we talk about marketing automation versus sales automation. So you get some uh, overviews as to how to choose the right software for, for cold email. How can you add a personal touch with sales emails? Mm, I'll start with the name, if nothing else, and at least you know try to figure out what the name of the person you're reaching out to. You know, there's two things: there's the um, have to play and have to win. The have to play is the thing that needs to be there in order to play the game, and the have to win is the thing that needs to be there in order to win the game. So the have to play is definitely at least have their name, right? It's the minimum stuff. If you're sending an email to someone, at least you should know how they're called. In the process of building the hot list that will come naturally because the more narrow and specific you are as to who your prospects are, the easier it will be to define something personal at greater scale. Yeah, I think to add personal touch with sales emails, assuming this question is not just talking about a one-off email that somebody's firing uh, to just one person, rewriting, sending to another, etc. I think it has to do with getting very segmented with your list and using merge tags. So like Jeremy said, use a lot of filters when you build your list. You know, it should be hard for a company to end up on your contact list. And if you do that, then you're going to have a very narrow conversation that only a few different companies will be able to resonate with. And thus it'll be a, a pretty personal message that's received. And finally, merge tags are helpful. Use it to grab things from the internet and drop them in the email so that it's a lot more personal, relevant to their business, you know, with merge tags, it makes it a little bit easier to do this at scale. If you manage to have a hot list and you can check, you know, episode five for that, then the personalization should be easy because you will narrow down to something so specific. Like they may be hiring for DevOps because they got infrastructure problem. And if your product is actually helping with that, then that's easy to sort of like personalize to their problem more than you know, having to mention that you've seen them at a, at a trade show or things like that. It sounds like personalization is more of a list building effort than anything else. Yeah, pretty much so. Next question. What are some common mistakes that people make when trying to identify potential sales prospects for, let's say, a small business cold email campaign? Yeah, actually, I'm going to pass this one because I think you're the expert on that. So I'll be happy to take notes as well. The biggest mistake is getting lazy with list building. Today, just filtering mm. by industry, company size, and job title isn't going to cut it anymore. And I think it's mostly because of what we just talked about, that the personalization aspect will be missing. So you need to get very detailed with who gets on your list so that you can have a relevant conversation with them. If you just pick an industry, uh, company size, and a job title, you're missing a whole lot of the backstory that you could use to start that conversation. Start with industry, start with size, and then start with job title. That's great. But then take it a step further and say, of those companies that you've just identified, which ones are hiring DevOps right now? And so, yeah, maybe it cuts that list from uh, 5,000 to 500 or maybe even just 100. But those are going to be 100 companies that have an acute pain point that you might be able to help solve. And even better, you're going to have a conversation starting point that you can use to reach out to these people and start a relevant conversation or bring a relevant 
uh, topic to the table that they will likely be interested in. Right, next one. Is cold emailing someone in their native language, you know, not necessarily English, is a good idea, question mark. That's your sweet spot here. I'm going to take <laughs> some notes now. I wanted to ask you, you know, do you actually use another language with your uh, cold email business? I have tried a few small sort of test batches, but honestly, one of the filters that we use is if somebody's LinkedIn profile is not in English, that usually tells us that we probably should either translate the copy or maybe pass and, and contact someone at their company that does speak English. So we are mindful of language, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear your take as a multilinguist. People actually perform better in native language that, you know, that aren't English for, for two good reasons. The first one is there is less competition. So when I see an email in my native language, it means like there is less spam in that, in that sense. Uh, when I see something in English, it could you know, be not necessarily addressed to me and it could be like part of a big batch of automation. But when it's in French, for example, in my case, it's easier for me to be receptive to that because not everyone is writing to me in my native language. The second reason for that, why it works, is that it's more personalized. Right. If people write to me in Spanish, I know that I'm not the right target, so I can just discard it. But if someone sends me an email in French, then it's like, oh, that person knows I'm speaking French. So it's like more personalized to some extent. So I think there is double advantage in, in doing cold email in a, in a native language that is different than English. Personalizing emails is always a good idea. And language is just yet another way that you could personalize a message to somebody. So... If you happen to speak the language or you have a translator who can help you, or better yet, if you're creating a campaign that's targeted at a specific country that doesn't speak English, it might make sense to have that campaign translated so it's a little bit more personalized. All right, so how many times should I follow up on a prospect without receiving an answer before I let them go or stop following up? No, that's a great one. Could you, uh, could you answer this one, Jack? Do you have something that is going to change your lives so the better? You know, if yes, then I think you owe it to them to share it so that they have an opportunity to decide if it's right for them or not. So people are busy. And just because somebody's not getting back to you with the first one, two, three, four, five emails, it doesn't necessarily mean that this isn't something they would like to pursue. It doesn't mean that they don't want to jump on a call with you the next week. In fact, we've seen positive replies come in after the 11th and even 12th email that uh, have gone out. And typically those replies are, hey, just sorry, was really busy or was on maternity leave. This looks interesting. So don't take silence as a no. But at the same time, make sure your cadence is set so that you're not just blasting emails every day, uh, just being repetitive with the same kind of message. Instead, space out the messages so that they're at a reasonable pace and be sure to include different value props in those emails so that you're letting the prospect know how exactly it can help them in each touch. Yeah. And Jeremy and I go into detail on how to vary the content in each follow-up email during episode 18. Now uh, you can check that out for a little bit more. Yeah. And you got also the episode 17 on A-B testing. So I want to give this one to you then. How can I create an effective cold email? Well, you, you have to start by defining what effective is for you. I think it's just, um, I think it's about starting a conversation with people. You could always start with a small call to action that will lead to a bigger one, to a bigger one, to a bigger one. So you have to define what, what effective cold email is for you. Um, I would encourage you not to take the entire funnel. So it's not up to a cell but it's up to getting a conversation. And if the conversation don't lead to sales, it means that you need to review your prospecting. Now, how it can be effective, most of the time it needs to be timely. So that means like, I got a problem right now and I received my email. That's why follow-ups are so effective because people are thinking like, ah, now it's not the right time. I'm going to ignore this. And then somehow you, you ping them at the right time in the right you know, mindset. Maybe, maybe they got a bit of... Uh, on time and they're really more receptive to your message. So follow-ups do play a strong role in effectiveness. 
What, what do you have, uh, Jack? You must have other things and other point of view on that. To create an effective cold email, I think there's a simple formula that says increase the reward your prospect will get by replying and decrease the effort required to reply. If you do those two things, you're going to get a lot of responses coming in. But just like Jeremy said, you've got to define what an effective cold email means. And I'm just assuming that getting that particular person to reply with the topic that you're emailing them about is a good thing. Well, that's it for Rapid Fire this week. And uh, we have a call to action for you guys. That's right. Send us an email at podcast at quickmail.io and shoot us your rapid fire question. Next time we do the rapid fire podcast, we'll make sure your question's in there and we'll answer it during the show. Hey, cold emailer. Yeah, you. If you got some value from this episode, give us a high vibe by sharing a two-sentence review on iTunes. Or Stitcher or TuneIn. That works too. It's a quick way to help other growth-minded folks like us find this podcast. So they can send awesome emails. And make everyone's inbox a better place. Thanks. 